Nectanebo II ruled in 360-342 BC, was the third and last pharaoh of the 30th dynasty, as well as the last native ruler of ancient Egypt. Under Nectanebo II, Egypt prospered. During his reign, the Egyptian artists delivered a specific style that left a distinctive mark on the relief sculpture of the Ptolemaic era. Like his indirect predecessor Nectanebo I, Nectanebo II showed enthusiasm for many of the cults of the gods within ancient Egyptian religion and more than a hundred Egyptian sites bear evidence of his attentions. Nectanebo II, however, undertook more constructions and restorations than Nectanebo I, commencing in particular the enormous Temple of Isis. For several years, Nectanebo II was successful in keeping Egypt safe from the Persian Achaemenid Empire. Betrayed by his former servant mentor of Rhodes, however, Nectanebo II was ultimately defeated by the combined Persian-Greek forces in the 343 BC Battle of Pelusium. In 342 BC, the Persians occupied Memphis and the rest of Egypt, incorporating the country back into the Achaemenid Empire. Nectanebo fled south and preserved his power for some time. His subsequent fate is unknown. Portraits, except for the small-scale grey wacky statue in the Metropolitan Museum, which shows Nectanebo II standing before the image of Horus. No other annotated portraits of Nectanebo II are known. In the grey wacky statue, Nectanebo II is shown in an Emmys and Uraeus. His bent arm with the sword stands for the hieroglyph Nact, the falcon represents Horus while the hieroglyph in Nectanebo's right hand stands for Heb. Other portraits attributed to Nectanebo II include a quartzite head in the Museum of the University of Pennsylvania Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology, a basalt head in Alexandria, a granite head acquired by the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, and a damaged quartzite head. Rise to power. In 525 BC Egypt was conquered by the Persian Achaemenid Empire. Because of internal struggles for the Persian royal succession, Egypt managed to regain independence in 404 BC. In 389 BC, Pharaoh Hakor negotiated a treaty with Athens and for three years managed to withstand Persian aggression. However, following the conclusion of the Peace of Antalcidas in 387 BC between Persia and the Greek city-states, Egypt and Cyprus became the only obstacles to Persian hegemony in the Mediterranean. At the beginning of 360 BC, Nectanebo's predecessor Taos started preparations for war against intruders. In the same year, the Egyptian army set off traveling along the coast by land and sea. Nectanebo II accompanied his uncle Taos in that campaign and was in charge of the Makamoi. In an attempt to raise finances for the war quickly, Taos imposed taxes on Egyptians and seized temple property. Egyptians, particularly the priests, resented those measures and supported Nectanebo II. Taos asked Spartan military leader Ages Alors and Athenian general Shabrias to preserve support for him. Ages Alors, however, said he was sent to aid Egypt and not to wage war against it. Shabrias with his mercenaries returned home. Taos decided to flee to the Persian court, where he ultimately died of natural causes. Nectanebo further contended with an unnamed pretender to the throne from the town of Jadet, who proclaimed himself pharaoh. The revolt was probably led by one of the descendants of Nephorites I, whose family had ruled the town before. The claimant sent messengers to Ages Alors in an attempt to persuade Ages Alors to his side. Ages Alors remained loyal to Nectanebo, fearing to become a turncoat and betrayer. At one of the towns in the Nile Delta the troops of Nectanebo and Ages Alors were besieged by the usurper, who had gained many sympathizers. Despite the enemy's numerical superiority, Nectanebo and Ages Alors were victorious and the revolt was put down in the fall of 360 BC. Acknowledging Ages Alors, Nectanebo sent him 220 talents of gold. 
reign. Religion played an important part in Nectanebo's domestic policy. He began his reign by officiating over the funeral of an apus bull in Memphis. Then Nectanebo added a relief decoration to the eastern and western temples of Apus. Among notable sanctuaries, erected under Nectanebo II, are a temple of Kanum in Abu and a temple of Amun at Sektam. He also dedicated a diorite and arrows to Anhushu. Nectanebo II was responsible for the increasing popularity of the Bukkis cult. Under Nectanebo II, a decree forbidding the stone quarrying in the so-called mysterious mountains in Obidos was issued. Foreign affairs under Nectanebo II were thwarted by repeated Persian attempts to reoccupy Egypt. Before the accession of Nectanebo II to the throne, Persians attempted to reclaim Egypt in 385, 383, and 373 BC. Nectanebo used the peace to build up a new army and employed Greek mercenaries, which was a usual practice at the time. In about 351 BC the Persians embarked on a new attempt to reclaim Egypt. After a year of fighting Nectanebo and his ally generals Diophantus of Athens and Lamius of Sparta managed to defeat the Persians, having scored a resounding victory over the Persians. Nectanebo II was acclaimed as Nectanebo the Divine Falcon by his people and cults were set up in his name. In 345-44 BC Nectanebo supported the Phoenician rebellion against the Persians, led by the king of Sidon Tennis and dispatched a military aid of 4,000 Greek mercenaries, led by Mentor of Rhodes. However, having heard of the approach of the forces of Artaxerxes III, Mentor opened communication with the Persians in collusion with Tennis. At the end of 344 BC, ambassadors of Artaxerxes III arrived in Greece asking for the Greeks' participation in a campaign against Egypt. Athens and Sparta treated the ambassadors with courtesy, but refrained from concluding an alliance against Egypt. Other cities, however, decided to support the Persians. Thebes sent 1,000 hoplites and Argos 3,000. In the winter of 343 BC Artaxerxes set off for Egypt. The Egyptian army, headed by Nectanebo, consisted of 60,000 Egyptians, 20,000 Libyans and as many Greek mercenaries. In addition Nectanebo had a number of flat-bottomed boats to prevent an enemy from entering the Nile mouths. The vulnerable points along his Mediterranean sea border and east boundary were protected by strongholds, fortifications and entrenched camps. Persian forces were strengthened by Mentor and his men, well acquainted with the eastern border of Egypt, and by 6,000 Ionians. Nectanebo II was ultimately defeated and, in the summer of 342 BC, Artaxerxes entered Memphis, where the Persians installed a satrap. Nectanebo fled to Upper Egypt and finally to Nubia, where he was granted asylum. He, however, preserved a degree of power there for some time. With the help of Chababash, Nectanebo made a vain attempt to regain the throne. Nectanebo and the Alexander Romance there is an apocryphal tale, appearing in the pseudo-historical Alexander Romance, which details another end for the last Egyptian pharaoh of Egypt. Soon after Alexander the Great's godhood was confirmed by the Oracle of Zeusamon, a rumor was begun that Nectanebo II, following defeat in his last battle, did not travel to Nubia but instead to the court of Philip II of Macedon in the guise of an Egyptian magician. There, while Philip was away on campaign, Nectanebo convinced Philip's wife Olympias that Haman was to come to her and that they would father a son. Nectanebo, disguising himself as Ammon, slept with Olympias and from his issue came Alexander. This myth would hold strong appeal for Egyptians who desired continuity and harbored a strong dislike for foreign rule. In art of this event, Nectanebo is usually depicted as having dragon-like features, for example in Speculum Historial. In the early Ptolemaic tale of Nectanebo and Petasus, only preserved in a Greek fragment from the Memphis Serapium, 
The pharaoh has a prophetic dream of Isis, in which the god Onurus is angry with him because of his unfinished temple in Sabenitos. Nectanebo calls in the best sculptor of the realm, Petasus, to finish the job, but he bungles his assignment when he gets drunk and chases a beautiful girl instead. The narrative ends abruptly here, but this is probably the preface to the fall of Egypt to the Persians. Abu Rehan al-Biruni in his book on India reproduces the story.